So we'll give folks a couple moments, but I'll start just by welcoming everyone to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome, 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 welcome. It's really nice to be here always, but uh, especially I haven't been here in two weeks and it feels like an eternity. Um, but I had my, um, yeah, my somewhat spiritual experience at Beyonce and uh it was a great teaching. I don't think I'm up for stadium shows. It turns out, um, but it was yeah. It was it was. I mean, she's exceptional, and being with so many humans was wow, incredible. And uh, yeah, just really nice to be back here and having this rhythm of getting to gather here. And for folks who it's your first time, especially welcome. Really lovely to have people join in on our community here and at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, it's a real priority for us to practice in community. And what that means is we get to learn from one another. We get to practice and be supported by each other's practice here. And part of that, being in community, it's hard, right? <laughs> in some ways, it's easier to read a book or use an app and just practice on our own. And yet the community is an essential piece of the Dharma. It's irreplaceable. And we will actually not make it very far on our path if we are not practicing in community. And so part of the rub of community, which is sometimes like, God, I wish they wouldn't breathe that way. Or why did they say that? Or it's totally not what I would have thought, right? All of that is like good material for our practice. You know, we live in the world with other beings. And even, you know, I think there's this um, misunderstanding about when practitioners go to a cave and do deep practice. It's not in order for them to remove themselves from the world and leave the world behind. It's in order for them to be able to remove distractions and really focus on their love for the world, their love for other beings. And so they can come out more available and kind of radiant with that love towards others. And so practicing in community here at the Dharma Collective, we really aspire to show up an embodied presence of compassion. So part of that is taking care of your body here, your posture, your sitting, to really listen with compassion. And so in our listening to these teachings and to one another, just really doing so with a gentleness and curiosity. Can you imagine this world if we all listened with gentleness and curiosity? <laughs> and you know weren't triggered by a million things along the way it's it's a, it's a beautiful idea right there's a different listening quality when we in some ways kind of lean back right we're leaning back in our compassion and listening and then when we speak it's really wonderful to hear folks in here share and ask questions and speaking with compassion and in that way of course we are leaning forward we're offering our voice but to really saturate with compassion what we're saying and by that it's really being thoughtful of what's the least harm we can do can we speak in a way that you know we really um, have that intention and aspiration like may this be of service right may this uh, may this be of benefit doesn't mean you have to ask like a good question or like the right question. It's just about the intention, right? And, and where we are speaking from. And this is our, our laboratory. We get to practice our compassionate embodiment, listening and speaking here uh, in order to bring it to the world. So yeah, I really feel so honored and appreciative to be part of the Dharma Collective where it feels like those values are, are so core. Um, and if I haven't met you before, I'm Eve Ekman, one of the teachers here. Uh, often Chandra Easton joins uh, these days online. Maybe some of you got to feed your demons with her last week. Oh uh, yeah, that's, that's good stuff. And yeah, it's, we have been making our way through this book. We are now in book three, all the way on page 385. This book is Old Path, White Clouds, 
If you've never seen it or heard it, not a problem. It's the historical life of the Buddha and uh, Siddhartha before he becomes the Buddha. And us following as he is learning, as he is sharing a lot of the teachings. And it's interesting, tonight we have yet another kind of buried jewel in this book. There's a lot of stories, really beautiful stories about you know individuals' lives who are transformed. The last time we were together, the story was of Angulimila, so of this former, essentially, mass murderer, right, who really didn't humans were worth anything and that the best thing he could do is eliminate all humans and how the Buddha met him with love and compassion. And there's this transformation. And so we have these stories of how people's lives are transformed by the teachings. And then also these really um, beautiful, clear ways to train our heart and mind. So we had about six weeks on um, the Satipatthana Sutta, which many of you know as the four foundations of mindfulness. And it's a really beautiful way of <clears throat> applying um, both our Vipassana, our kind of inquiry and examination, um, as well as our Kshamata, like our uh, ability to have tranquility and focus to our body and breath and uh, to our feelings, to our mind, and to the mental formations. And this week, we've made ourselves um, all the way to the Anapatati Sutta. And it is really a fun um, practice. And I, I'd like us to I'd like us to practice it together in some ways in the order of which it was first instructed. We're going to actually take it apart a little, kind of quoting my dear friend and wonderful teacher, Michael Taft, we're going to deconstruct it a bit. So this practice or this teaching, this sutta, is 16 breaths. And each of these breaths has a very special meaning. So we're going to make our way through breath by breath. So I'll read out, they're, they're either in stanzas of two or four, and we'll practice the breath together. And then we'll look at and kind of review the reason why this breath is included. And what is the meaning specifically of, for example, noticing a breath that is short or noticing a breath that is long. So we'll practice each of these, reflect on them, and then practice them all together which this is uh, sometimes this practice is called the practice of exalted happiness. So no promises, no expectations, but see for yourself. It's a real refuge practice. I do have to say, however, that the practice comes out of um, quite a sad story in this book um, and quite a difficult kind of teaching or lesson. So there is, I'll read a little bit of this and then we'll go into this uh, full awareness of breathing is what, what it's called. So there was a time in which the, the Buddha was um, teaching, you know, very specifically, very often this kind of um, disenchantment with the human form, in some ways developing a, a distaste for the human form. Not because humans are gross or bad, but because the number one thing in between us and our awakened nature Anybody? Us. <laughs> and then like our clinging onto ourself, the self-cherishing. I just, at word, those two words didn't mean a lot to me for many years, but I just think self-cherishing, it really hits it for me. Anybody have a, a willingness to, to share their understanding? Like what's self-cherishing mean? What do we mean when we say self-cherishing? Welcome. Yes. Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I. Right. As like the focus, priority, mm -hmm, the goal. Yeah. Yes. Just enjoying myself. Enjoying myself. Who I am. Not, oh, I'm going to enjoy myself by going to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a great way to enjoy myself. Yeah. But can I just enjoy who I am? regardless of where I am. Yeah. So that's a little, that's not self-cherishing. That's beautiful. 
Self-cherishing is our fixation upon us. So great distinction, right? So self being okay with ourself, you know, irrespective of circumstances, that's the goal. The self is that the answer to self-cherish. Yeah, right. It's a it's like um being able to experience whatever is happening without this sense of that doesn't really work for me. I don't, I want it to be different. I, 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 right? Like we're the focus and, and also, you know, and really not subtle. I love reading the story of the Buddha, you know, thousands of years ago, because it helps me remember it's not just now when people have been so self-obsessed and, uh, you know, into the material world and in the Buddhist time, it's, it's a bit different, right? But still there's so like the beautiful, like kind of ornaments of dress and, everyone has these very fine not everyone but those who are very fortunate in this time have really fine clothes and they become you know of course really interested in how much more wealth they can accumulate right how much more can i get how much more can i have and then self-cherishing it's such a losing battle like even if you're awesome and you look great right and you have awesome clothes it's always slightly diminishing so this grasping onto ourself, this holding on, um, I don't know if any of you else have noticed in this room, but we age, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes quicker than we would like. And so no matter how much we cherish our youthful self, which is a very common piece, not only in contemporary society, but um, often we are kind of setting ourselves up for this misery. And so then we spend more and more time obsessing over how to protect and preserve what we have. That's why self-cherishing gets in the way so much. It, it takes a lot of time, right? <clears throat> and so these teachings to kind of counter that, they sometimes are very harsh, really seeing the putrefication of the body seeing the body and its viscera as, as kind of grotesque. And so the Buddha taught this as a kind of, um, you know, just cut through, stop cherishing your body. It's just guts and blood. And it's just the same as a carcass. Why do you even like it? You know, the, very strong teachings, right? Like go sit in the graveyard, which at this time is an open charnel ground and watch a body decay. How special is the body? Not very special after 48 hours. And that's a really, you know, powerful form of teaching. But unfortunately, some of the bhikkhus or some of the monks in the monastery uh, where he had done these teachings became so kind of overly focused on that, that they took their own lives. There's enough accounts of this. I mean, you know, all of this is story passed down. Nothing was written down at the time of the Buddha. We don't know but that uh, there was a whole group who just said, wow, I can't believe like this is, this is the problem. This disgusting obsession with this thing that's just like a corpse, right? Uh, so that self-disgust. And so as a counteract, as a counteract, he taught this Anapitati Sutta. I have such a hard time pronouncing this. I'm sorry, y'all. Let me say it correctly. On a uh, full awareness of breath, Anapati Sutta. And um, it's interesting because this is supposed to be an antidote to that deep level of depression, disgust, and shame, because it gives you so much lift. So it's not, don't keep thinking about how the body is just bones, and it's really not something you should cherish, but also balance it out, right? And I think um, in, in our times, um, as in many times, there's a lot to feel despair about, a lot to feel hopeless about, a lot to feel like, wow, humans whose idea with this right you know and so I, I really appreciate just getting these practices that are so simple and yet offer us this opportunity to feel kind of a refuge and a reprieve they have a relationship with the four foundations of mindfulness but they're they're different um so that that is that is us so coming out of a bit of of tragedy and there's a really beautiful, some of you may be very familiar with this, um, 
this kind of phrase or this, you know, famous saying of the Buddha. But when these monks uh, took their own life is when the Buddha gave this little teaching that is called the raft is not the shore. And so he said, the teaching is merely a vehicle to describe the truth. Don't mistake it for the truth itself. A finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. The finger is needed to know where to look for the moon. But if you mistake the finger for the moon itself, you'll never know the real moon. The teaching is like a raft that carries you to the other shore. The raft is needed, but the raft is not the other shore. An intelligent person would not carry the raft around on his head, making it across after making it across the other shore. My teaching is the raft, which can help you cross to the other shore beyond birth and death. Use the raft to cross to the other shore, but don't hang on to it as your property. Don't get caught up in the teaching. You must be able to let it go. So really interesting. Um, yeah, so it's that balance for us of really, you know, if we have, you know, I, I do admire these bhikkhus and their, their commitment to take on the teaching so deeply. But how do we take on the teachings, but um, not forget that the, the purpose of the teachings is liberation, not to become obsessed with the teachings, right? I think the Buddha would be maybe not so pleased at the myriad tomes of books on discourses on the teachings, <laughs> right? There's a lot of obsession with the teachings, um, but, you know, to each their own, if that helps folks in their awakening. But it was, you know, he, he didn't want any of it written down, right? Because he knew if he wrote it down, it would become a doctrine. And then you'd get so obsessed with it and say, well, what about this? And what about that? So anyway, I love this idea of the, the living nature of the teachings. So we're going to get started with the breaths. And again, we'll go a breath or two at a time. Notice how it feels, kind of reflect on the quality of the breath. So find a, a posture that feels supportive for your practice. And as a means to settle in, really inviting a softness through the eyes. So much of our life is through this visual world and sense portal of sight. So feeling as though we could almost unplug, release. And continue to invite that softening around the eyes. And feel a sense of being supported by the ground beneath you. Just recognizing that you are not needing to support yourself by standing or, or holding yourself in any way. You can really release and let the burden down of holding. And inviting a quality of stability through the body.
I'm choosing to be here in stillness, stillness of body as in we're not going anywhere and getting anything, but also the stillness of choosing to not follow thoughts, not make plans, not engage in inner speech as much as possible. So a deep inner and outer stillness. Before we start with the practice, take a moment and really be curious and kind towards whatever is present in the space of the body, heart, and mind. Maybe we notice there is fatigue. Maybe there is weariness. Maybe excitement. Just notice and make space for whatever emotional residue is here from the day, the week. And breathing in and breathing out and just being curious about the quality of these sensations in the body. How does these experiences of emotion arise, where are they located, and can we invite breath to permeate them, make them less dense? A couple more breaths here, making space for sensations in the body. With our next breath, reflecting on these simple instructions, breathing in a long breath. I know I am breathing in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath. I know I am breathing out a long breath. Remembering this knowing is not a concept or idea. It's a knowing of feeling the breath from within. So one or two more breaths, breathing in, knowing I am breathing in a long breath. And breathing out, no, I am breathing out a long breath. And the instruction for our second breath. Breathing in a short breath. I know I am breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath. I know I am breathing out a short breath.
These two breaths enable you to cut through forgetfulness and unnecessary thinking, at the same time giving rise to mindfulness and enabling you to encounter life in the present moment. Forgetfulness is the absence of mindfulness. Breathing with awareness enables us to return to ourselves and life. For the third breath, breathing in, I am aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I am aware of my whole body. This breath enables you to contemplate the body and be in direct contact with your own body. Awareness of the whole body and awareness of every part of the body allows you to see the wondrous presence of your body in the process of birth and death unfolding in your body. In the fourth breath, I am breathing in and making my whole body calm and at peace. I am breathing out and making my whole body calm and at peace. This breath helps you realize calmness and peace in the body and arrive at a state in which mind, body, and breath are one harmonious reality. In the fifth breath, I am breathing in and feeling joyful. I am breathing out and feeling joyful. For the sixth breath, I am breathing in and fe feeling happy. I am breathing out and feeling happy. We can allow our breath to be completely natural. No need to hold or extend the breath in any, any way, just the natural rhythm of your breath. With these two breaths, you cross into the domain of feelings. These two breaths create peace and joy that can nourish mind and body. Thanks to the cessation of dispersion and forgetfulness, you return to yourself, aware of the present moment. Happiness and joy arise within you. You dwell in the wonders of life, able to taste the peace and joy mindfulness brings. Thanks to this encounter with the wonders of life, you're able to transform neutral feelings into pleasant feelings. These two breaths thus lead to pleasant feelings.
And on to the seventh breath. I am breathing in and am aware of the activities of the mind in me. I am breathing out and I'm aware of the activities in mind in me. No need here to deny our thoughts, but also not engaging, bringing our awareness to awareness of mind. And the eighth breath, I am breathing in and making the activities of the mind in me calm and at peace. I am breathing out, making the activities of mind and me calm and at peace. These two breaths enable you to look deeply at all the feelings arising within you, whether they are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, and enable you to make those feelings calm and at peace. The activities of the mind mean, in this case, feelings. When you are aware of your feelings, you can see deeply into their roots. You can control them and make them calm and at peace, even though they may be unpleasant thoughts from anger, desire, and jealousy. And on to the ninth breath. I am breathing in and aware of my mind. I am breathing out and aware of my mind. And the 10th breath, I am breathing in and making my mind happy and at peace. I am breathing out, making my mind happy and at peace. The 11th breath, I am breathing in and concentrating my mind. I am breathing out and concentrating my mind. With the 12th breath, I am breathing in and liberating my mind. I am breathing out and liberating my mind.
With these four breaths, aware of mind, making mind happy at peace, breathing in and concentrating and liberating, you cross into the third domain, which is the mind. The ninth breath enables you to recognize all states of mind, perceptions, thinking, discrimination, happiness, sadness, and doubt. Observing and recognizing in order to see deeply into the mind's activities. When the mind's activities are observed and recognized, you're able to concentrate your mind, making it quiet and at peace. The 12th breath enables you to release all obstacles of the mind. Thanks to illuminating your mind, you can see the roots of all mental formations and overcome all obstacles. And the 13th breath. I am breathing in and observing the impermanent nature of all dharmas. I am breathing out, observing the impermanent nature of all dharmas. The 14th breath, I am breathing in and observing the fading of all dharmas. I am breathing out and observing the fading of all dharmas. Fifteenth breath, I am breathing in and contemplating liberation. I am breathing out and contemplating liberation. In the 16th breath, I am breathing in and contemplating letting go. I am breathing out, contemplating letting go. With these breaths, the practitioner passes into the domain of objects of mind, concentrates the mind, and observes the true nature of all dharmas. The observation of the impermanent nature of all dharmas. Because they are all impermanent, they fade. And when you clearly understand the impermanent and fading nature of all dharmas, you're no longer bound to the endless cycle of birth and death. Thanks to that, you can let go and attain liberation. Letting go does not mean to disdain or run away from life. Letting go means letting go of craving, clinging, so you do not suffer from the endless cycle of birth and death. Once you have let go and attain liberation, you can live in peace and joy in the very midst of life. There is no longer anything which can bind you. And so we'll return and just do each breath one by one. 
Breathing in, I know I am breathing in a long breath. Breathing out, a long breath. I know I am breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath. I know I am breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath. I know I am breathing out a short breath. Breathing in, I'm aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I am aware of my whole body. I am breathing in and making my whole body calm and at peace. I am breathing out and making my whole body calm and at peace. I am breathing in and feeling joyful. I am breathing out and feeling joyful. I am breathing in and feeling happy. I am breathing out and feeling happy. I am breathing in, I'm aware of the activities of the mind in me. I'm breathing out, I'm aware of the activities in mind in me. I am breathing in and making the activities of mind in me calm and at peace. I am breathing out and making the activities of mind in me calm and at peace. I am breathing in and aware of my mind. I am breathing out and aware of my mind. I am breathing in and making my mind happy and at peace. I am breathing out, making my mind happy and at peace. I am breathing in, concentrating my mind. I am breathing out, concentrating my mind. I am breathing in and liberating my mind. I am breathing out and liberating my mind. I am breathing in and observing the impermanent nature of all dharmas. I am breathing out and observing the impermanent nature of all dharmas. I am breathing in and observing the fading of all dharmas. I am breathing out and observing the fading of all dharmas. I am breathing in and contemplating liberation. I am breathing out and contemplating liberation. I am breathing in and contemplating letting go. I am breathing out and contemplating letting go. And then allowing ourselves to release the focus on the breath and taking a bit of time to rest in what spacious awareness may be available from this focus on the breath, deep exploration into a full awareness of breath. So instead, almost as though you were widening the aperture of awareness, allow a full spaciousness above, below, side to side. When thoughts naturally arise, just gently leaning back in the mind, allowing them to dissipate and fade. Checking in again to the face and seeing if you can soften once again the face and now the chest and belly. And also feeling an uprightness and vividness through the spine and the crown.
inviting a full experience of awareness, not mediated by someone watching or experiencing, just feeling full presence of awareness, all directions. Regathering the attention to the body and breath. And taking a moment to notice if there is any sense of that nourishment of body, heart, and mind. Thank you for your practice. So for folks here, I would love um, if you have a question or comment that we can use the mic so our friends at home can hear us. And friends at home, if you would like to share a question or comment, just please raise your hand. Yeah, very curious. Many of the folks know in this room, this night tends to be more of a Vajrayana, Tibetan Buddhist night. So it's been really fun to read this really Theravadan book and explore these practices that are not as common, at least in our tradition. Um, and I've been really enjoying the richness of that with you all. It's kind of this intensive focus um, on the breath in this way. And with especially these instructions, I find so interesting. I would love to hear how other people are experiencing these practices or any questions about these practices. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello, I'm Yohan. Um, I would love to share a few things with you. About three hours ago, um, I, I was asked to help someone. I said yes. It took me back to a place, a realm of reality where I spent the last two years meeting with my suffering. Mm. I wanted to help that person. That was my first feeling. Like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll help you. It's easy. A lot of questions came to my mind. My son running. What if? What if? I calm myself. And you remain mindful about the situation. 
in order to create a positive energy and to find the answer. So I went and helped that person. It just took five, 10 minutes and I was gone. It was good to see that person again. It was good to leave also without being sucked back to that wall. But, hmm. um, the funny thing is I've been thinking about that person today, just think, see how she was doing. She was okay. And she reached out to me. She didn't think I would pick up. I'm like, didn't change anything about my feelings. No matter where I am right now, I still have love for that person. Hmm. A generous love. And I wasn't sure if I was going to come here tonight. And she was the reason why I came here. <laughs> she created that. Now, coming back to the exercise. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank the Buddha, but yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, it's like actually what I needed. Mm. I had a... The introduction tonight was exactly the reason why I came. We mm. really needed to meet with the Sangha. Yeah. Um, you've been seeing me coming. Yeah. You know, like to be more present. And yeah. I am. I'm your one again. <laughs> Maybe I'll stay at the end and like meet some of you. Nice. Yeah. I really love that. <laughs> um, but coming back to the exercise. Um, wow. Um, there was that moment around like the 12 or the 13 breath where I was able to look at my mind. Watch mm. it. And it was very pleasant to watch. Mm. Just being very quiet, almost like my mind didn't have to worry about myself. Mm. It was free on its own. Mm. Then on 15, around that park, the stillness. Uh, wow. I really feel that sweetness mm -hmm. and observing my mind. Um, and also doing that all exercise, it was a lot of smiling, <laughs> a lot of feeling about energy. Mm -hmm. um, and toward the end, I felt about the awareness, like I was floating almost. Mm -hmm. Didn't last long when I have a, a glimpse of it. Wonderful. <laughs> Good. Thank, Thank you, you. Johan. Yeah. Thanks for sharing with us. Yeah, I not not traditional, at least in this book, to go into that spacious awareness mm -hmm. uh, at the end of full awareness of breathing, but I have found there's such a benefit of the kind of intensive focus and then the oscillation towards openness. And um, some of you are familiar with Dzogchen teachings here, and it's very simply like it's the no method method. Mm -hmm. It's just the opening up into space. So simple, but not easy. And I think sometimes when we give ourselves these um, steps of really focusing the mind, stilling the mind, observing the mind, observing feelings, that openness can can find itself. And even if there's just a moment of it, it really can be quite nourishing. So I did a little uh, jazz improvis improvisation with the Buddha tonight. Uh, I hope he, I, I don't think Thich Nhat Hanh would mind. So I see, is that Ron? Like I might need glasses. Yeah, Claudia had her hand raised for quite a while. Claudia and then Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Eve. Um, well, tonight's um, session really resonated with me because um, I just came out of spending almost 12 days with COVID for the first time. Oh, I'm so sorry. And, uh, you know, I mean, we have practiced here and know what it's like to have those incredibly delicious diaphragmatic breaths, like yeah. really, really deep. 
And there was one night when I was in the thick of the illness where I was acutely, acutely aware of my breath. Mm. And I had difficulty breathing, even though I've had five shots, you know, and so much so, I mean, I, I spent the whole night sleepless. I, I, I just couldn't, couldn't sleep. And then in the morning, I had to go to the hospital so they could give me something because it was that hard. And the anguish and the anxiety of not being able to breathe uh, deep uh, yeah. were even spiking my, my blood pressure, you know. So I am fortunately now on the other side. And as you know, I, I swim and I went back for the first time swimming on, on Monday. I'm in mm. Mexico, in Mexico still. And uh, I mean, I just, I can't be grateful enough. Mm. And I mean, it is so sacred and so yeah. meaningful to me, the breath, yes. life, life, you know? And yeah. uh, I just, uh, I just, tonight it really resonated. I mean, it really, uh, because of this experience. And uh, at the same time though, I, I it kind of bothered me a little bit, to be honest. Uh, it, as you were going through the different motions, I, I felt like it was a little, I'm sorry, Eve, but it felt a little, pres- I, I'll be honest. I mean, I just felt like it was a little prescriptive or something. I don't know. I, I felt it, kind of weird. It, 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 yeah. It felt funny. I mean, I didn't quite really enjoy it, except for the parts where you were talking about breathing joy or happiness. And, yeah. You know, um. I have a question when you were talking about the thoughts, because at times we had to let go of the thoughts and at times we had to, I guess, pay attention to the thoughts, but not really grasp them. Is that it? Mm-hmm. Okay. You mean in the instructions on the breath? Right, right. Or in the more spacious awareness? No, in the instructions of the, of the breath. There's, um. let's see here. <laughs> Recognize the states of mind, observe the states in order to see deeply into them, then concentrate. And from there, you kind of come to the state of peace because you're able to um, release all the obstacles of the mind. So if Mm -hmm. we think about all the, you know, busyness of our mind, our planning, Mm -hmm. our reflection, you know, all the things it's impossible for us to actually like really cut them at their root Mm -hmm. if we don't see them and understand their nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this, it's really like knowing and recognizing, Oh, there's thoughts. That's how it's coming through. And, you know, with it, there's a lot of different ways you're kind of permeating into it here. Um, You're like getting your way all the way to the very depth of this liberation um so this first phase i think there is like illuminating the mind so you can see it all and then once you're able to see it there is the release right there is the letting go Mm -hmm. but it it's like i i think there's a real elegance to the process here it's definitely not how i usually teach is this perspective right right. it feels so weird it felt really weird to me not how i usually teach and i really respect the I respect the uh, the prescription. Uh, it feels really skillful, you know, how these stanzas are brought together and, you know, just the beauty of like pulling us in, you know, deeper and deeper. I mean, you're, you have your own sutta of the like preciousness of breath tonight, uh, which is also just so beautiful, right? To really feel that intimacy with the breath and the sacredness. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with this, it's, it's even, it's using breath, but it's really using breath almost as like a tether, just as a way to kind of pull our attention towards different aspects here, aspects of, of course, the breath and its length, but also really like what's in the mind. What's, you know, what are our feelings? What are our thoughts? And 
can we actually see them at their root? Can we actually recognize that it's impermanent? And then can we really let go? Mm -hmm. But I also like the in-betweens where we're inviting the joy, inviting the happiness in yeah. the body, in the mind, in the feeling. So there's, yeah, I think, you know, for sure people teach three-week retreats on this, right? Um, and we're kind of just cruising through and if there feels like a calling or an interest sometimes the calling and the interest is frustration i don't know about you all but sometimes i'm like i don't know about that i don't really like it and i'm like i'm gonna look at it more oh i really like it <laughs> so it might be that it's like an initial agitation but there could be some spark there um yeah i know you have the book so i i'd be curious if you like you know read it and sit with like what i did the last couple of days was i would what just sit with one. It? what it's chapter uh, 56. Okay. Yeah. I would just like sit with one or two for a while and then sit and really feel the flavor of each of them as well. Well, you um, felt great when you said, I think at some point you said something about the inner and outer peace and being one with the body and, and the mind or something like that. And, and when you finally have the, the total silence of the mm. mind, you know, inner and outer, that felt great yeah um, and the joy and the happiness but and like i said i mean i just i i am so grateful and i just love well. the the breathing and the yeah. i i just find it sacred and i can't say enough i don't know it's just thank you claudia and thanks for sharing with us and i'm so relieved you're on the mend yeah thank you thank you, thank you. yeah Hi, Ron. Hi, Eve. Um, <laughs> hi, Claudia. Um, I uh, I feel like we're um, simpatico right now. I uh, I am recovering from a pretty severe bout of pneumonia. Oh no! So breathing is. <laughs> I'm very grateful that um, I made it through most of that without going into coughing fits. So it was, it was. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm better. I'm I'm getting better. But I I, uh, I wish I could be there tonight, and um, I can't. But that um, that that was um, that was beautiful. Um, mm. I, I I love the way that you did it. I'll I'll be um I'll be listening to this one again and 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 going through it. And I'm going to take your suggestion that you just gave Claudia to you know go through the book and, and yeah. spend some time. Um, but uh, yeah. So I mean, I mean, first of all, I I I think I got the suggestion right, and I was really trying to um you know, kind of struggling with and having more success sometimes than others, not really just reciting, um, you know, what you were saying in, in my head, but trying to really experience, you know, the, the, the actual experience of that. And, and, um, and, and, and all the way through, you know, I had varying success. Um, but uh, that little improv at the end was really helpful to really look into where I got to from, you mm. know, what I got from this, um, this experience, which was, um, you know, it, it put me in a place where, where, you know, I, I, I felt like I, I got, I felt like I received a really deep, I, I received a really deep teaching that, that I, I, I learned something that I got it and, and I got it on a level that, I was, I, I think I have a question because I, I don't know how to describe, like, I, I, I don't know where I was, like, what was, this isn't like something I've learned. This isn't in my mind. This is like um, a settling in to, mm. to, to understanding liberation, understanding impermanence, understanding, you know, on, on, um, in a different way that I don't quite know how to describe. <laughs> You're doing beautifully. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm asking for help in describing that is my question. I don't really help. <laughs> um, I'll, you know, I can, um, you know, enter, entertain you a bit, but just, you know, really 
you got it, you know, you've got it. And there is, right. That's why there is the word, the ineffable. When we talk about, you know, these spiritual states, um, it, it's the finger pointing at the moon, right? So I can continue to describe like, yeah, it's spacious and it's luminous. And, but the experience of it, that's exactly, um, that's exactly our aspiration. And it's interesting you picked up on that with, you know, again, the intention of the Buddha of this teaching was to help kind of yank people back. Stop getting so obsessed with the teaching, feel it feel it right and so it seems like that uh, transmission came through for you ron and i think it is it can be not only again this refuge and this nourishing and this restoration but a reminder to not kind of get too caught up in method we can really get so caught up in our method we get a little tight some of us overachiever strivers, you know, want to do it right. So can we feel it? And can that be the right? So, yeah, thank you for sharing. So glad you're healing. My goodness, everybody. Yeah, it does, you know, it feels always, but it does feel like um, there's some heaviness around these days. Um, so really nice to be able to have these teachings as a refuge. Yes. So that just gave me a little bit of insight that I want to ask anyways. Is that in relation to the impermanence of the Dharma? Mm, uh, of, as in all Dharmas. I know. What was the line in there? It's confusing when you use, use the word Dharma for more than one thing. Yeah. It really means impermanence of all things. Okay. Right. Yes. That helps. Yeah. No, I know. I almost thought about editing, but I'm like, well, those are his words. <laughs> Same with, I actually, as much as I like, I'm breathing in feeling joyful. When I read the description, to me, it's I'm breathing in feeling gratitude. And when I'm breathing in and feeling happy, I would actually say I'm breathing in feeling awe. As it really is like this nurturing richness. Whereas in our contemporary culture, I think joy and happy feels very high arousal, like, you know, like, ah, right. And this is, you know, creating peace and joy that nourish, you know, like, because we're aware of the present moment, we're happy. And I think that's really a, an ability to appreciate just the richness of the present moment, because we're not trying to go there or here. And that's, in my, my understanding, gratitude. Well, thank you for that, because of that list the one thing is like where's the gratitude where's the gratitude <laughs> yeah thank you yeah no thank you yes i'd like to add something at the rebound on what you just said before and our friend over there um i read something that makes sense to be uh knowledge is sometimes is an obstacle to understanding mm. um that really spoke to me yeah I mean, it's hard to put uh, your feelings or your experience through words yes um, and it's like when the buddha said i got the water now i need the infrared to share it with you yeah it's small mm. that's what i feel sometimes mm. i do have the water but i don't know how to share it yet mm. thank you yeah and words are so useful and yet um they can get really tricky right and this knowledge and it's so interesting some folks may know but in you know places like tibet and nepal and india there are certain scholars of buddhism who never practice meditation like there's a whole other air, like there's an arena of just the scholarly knowledge really different from the experiential practice so to separate those um i don't know I, I think I think it's it's pretty clear that having both integrated is is so helpful, and we can get a little lost in the trying to explain or trying to know. Any other 
Questions, comments? Yes. Thank you. I have a question regarding the analogy in the beginning of the teaching, mm. um, like the raft. Yeah. Karma. Yeah. I wonder in this point, is there any meaning implied by the term of the bed? How do we? Oh, interesting. Let's, let's read it again. The question was um, an interest in this analogy of the raft and the shore. And is there any um, interpretation we could make on the current of the river or the bank of the river? So mm -hmm. the teaching is like a raft that carries you to the other shore. The raft is needed, but the raft is not the other shore. An intelligent person would not carry the raft around on his head after making it across to the other shore. My teaching is the raft. It can help you cross to the shore beyond birth and death. Use the raft to help cross to the other shore, but don't hang on to it as your property. Don't become caught in the teaching. Yeah, what would the current, I mean, the current, I think, is would probably be like the eight worldly winds, right? All of our obsessions of relative reality um, that make it really tough for us to even appropriately use the raft given to us. Making it to the other shore sounds great. <laughs> You know, like getting attached to the raft, like a secondary problem. Um, so I think there's something interesting. But, you know, the river, as an analogy, comes up so often um, in these teachings. And even the word, you know, mind stream. I think I hear that a lot in um, describing, you know, just the ongoing shifting and changing of our thoughts, our memories, our images. Um, so that to me feels a bit like that kind of fluidity and maybe not exactly current. Um, yeah, and I do think there's a, like being able to also another analogy of like, can we sit on the river and watch, sorry, can we sit on the bank and watch the flow go by without getting caught up, without falling in? So... Um, and last thing, this is really more tangential than uh, a deeper reading, but one of my favorite poems of all time by Thich Nhat Hanh, I'll bring it next week, I don't have it here, is the story of a river who wants to be a cloud. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know that one. It is just beautiful. Um, and I think that, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh really has a real sense, and you really get it here, of the kind of um, the interaction with the world as living. Right, this kind of animist way of being in the world that, of course, all of our ancestors lived with for most of human history. And he brings so much alive here in the natural world, metaphors of the natural world. Always the Buddha, you know, sleeping outside, never sleep. He has a hut, but he's never going to be in a house, in a palace, right? And this deep connection with nature, always barefoot on the earth. So it's a lot of riffing, really not answering, but I love, I love the question. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I mean, I, I just like, as soon as you started counting, it kind of felt like I was, uh, you know, kind of going under for a surgery and I, I don't know, I, I guess that's not your fault. That's more like a me problem, but, um, I like kind of remember eight and then everything else like kind of was, was, you know, black yeah. until like the very end. Um, so I guess like, um, for this type of thing, I, I guess like I, I just was hoping for, um, maybe some recommendations for kind of staying more present with your, uh, guides for yeah. future, you know, I mean, beyond sleeping yeah. more, taking a nap beforehand or yeah. drinking an energy drink. Which yeah. This isn't really good for me at this point. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think, and, uh, thank you for that. I mean, maybe you did go under and have like a spiritual surgery, you know, some kind of hypnagogic light, yeah. uh, just coming through. Um, it is really hard to not fall asleep in the evening practicing, yeah. just period. And for most of us, we baseline overexpose ourselves to media and stimulation all day long. And I think, you know, there's such a just a fundamental understanding of, of meditation is it's not going to take away all the bad habits, not forget not bad habits, all the 
counterindicated things we do towards our meditation. If we have a huge burrito, if we, um, you know, are crashing from coffee, if we've picked up our phone, what's the average time? 85 times today, right? Like, we can't expect to sit down and all of a sudden meditation will take over. And that's why meditation is not just what happens with your eyes closed. It's the whole way that we start to approach our life. And, you know, I don't, um, I don't know about folks here and, and we have such a beautiful like recovery community um, here at the Dharma Collective. Uh, I myself, I just noticed that if I have a beer, which I um, find enjoyable occasionally for two days, two days, my meditation kind of sucks. And so that's like a real choice I have to make. I'm like this, mm, mm, you know, like those are the choices, like when we start paying attention um, and like, it's completely okay to both fall asleep in meditation sometimes and to have two fuzzy days of meditation. Like meditation just gets, it gets like dull. It's like a light that's not quite on, at least for me. Um, but I think that, you know, falling asleep in meditation, we can really get hard on ourselves on. I mentioned his name before, but Andrew Holacek, who writes, uh, who has a beautiful book on dream yoga, in which he references a lot of um, Wangyal Rinpoche, who's a who's local here, um, teachings in Tibetan Buddhism. But also, he, he really digs into how do we work with being sleepy and tired? And so he made me feel that being tired and wanting to nap could be an actual spiritual exploration and not a problem. So I really recommend him. Yeah. He's got like a, a ton of free podcasts. And then the, I really, his book though is really good. I appreciate that being on sleep because I struggle with sleep a lot. Mm. I have actually been insomniatic at this point. Mm. I'm hoping that this helps. Yeah. And just for folks at home, um, someone's saying that they really appreciate that view on sleep and have been struggling with insomnia. And I mean, it is such a uh, kind of, I think, an indicator of our time, how much insomnia is like one of the biggest things that people are struggling with when it comes to mental health, right, is is challenges with sleep, challenges with anxiety, and of course, the dynamic relationship between the two. Um, but like I said, it is, it's one of those like hygiene things of our day of, you know, how can we start to really, you know, prepare ourselves for what matters, whether that's sleep or spiritual practice. Yes. I'm curious about um, like meditation and sort of this mindfulness, I, you know, practice and, and flow state mm. um, um, because I find flow state to be quite similar, like, uh, and it's sort of the, the product of my mindfulness, mm. but I also find it to be, um, you know, it, it overlaps with the sort of meditative, hmm. you know, process. Yeah. And, um, I was just curious. You yeah. find out more. Yeah. So um, it's such a popular word, but just in case some folks aren't familiar, like flow, um, which Chick Mezahali, really hard name at Claremont University. He actually just passed this last year and um, was such a wonderful, joyful researcher, kind of one of the pioneers in psychology of looking not just at what's wrong with you, right? <laughs> but like what might be okay with you, right? So he studied these states where people feel, this was his equation. He studied dancers, athletes, you know, anyone who got to, a, rock climbers who got to a state where there was just enough challenge and just enough reward. So it's this interesting balance, like our flow state where we feel we can be completely absorbed in the task because it's both enjoyable and challenging. So watching TV, is that a flow state? Pop quiz. No, right? That's not challenging. That's just, right. So the flow state means like there's an engagement. 
it's really interesting. And then like, I love, you know, Claudia is like this, you know, it's kind of annoying, right? That little bit of frustration, like that actually could be right before a flow state, right? Just like, mm, this is kind of hard. Oh, wait, I got it. Ooh, I'm so into it. Right. So there's a really interesting quality of flow and what it feels like when we're in flow again is absorption. And, and many of the yogis in the room know absorption is a kind of a synonym for samadhi. It's being so absorbed in our practice of breathing that the world falls away. Has anyone ever tasted that? Man, it is like the high you keep chasing. You know, you get like a little bit of that samadhi and it is, I mean, it's just incredible. It's beautiful. And I believe we can live in that state. I don't think it has to be occasional, you know, just so much saturating the present moment with our awareness that nothing else matters. And it's not this disconnected, aloof, it's just this real ability to be here. So I think in that way, there is this interesting relationship, right? Could we have flow, meaning an absorbed kind of engagement with anything that was happening? Right. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting, though, usually flow because it's physical activity. I often don't think of it as meditation, but it does have these like overlapping qualities. You know, flow state is definitely used now more also in like the context of business or, you know, other pursuits. But um and I think, yeah, do you experience flow, Josh? <laughs> I just went to this little crazy thing out in the desert. Oh, the sloppy burn. Sloppy burn. <laughs> sloppy, but beautiful. Yeah. Desert needs a little water to bloom. <laughs> um, but it really is such uh it's such a cauldron of different energies mm -hmm. and you know going out for a couple of weeks and being there for the pre-build and then the party and then the wrap-up you're sort of like weaving around with all of these different energies of mm -hmm. people that you know are throwing themselves into their projects yeah. and, or supporting people and helping people with their projects and yeah. things and and so it was quite a flow state mm. like, and, and, and for me, it's like, I mean, that's one of the most precious things for me yeah. ever. And it was very interesting to sort of feel meditative, mm. you know, just in that state yeah. for an extended period of time yeah. with people. With people. Yeah. You know? What, what do you enjoy about it? Well, I mean, for me, it's just um, this creation of something that, you know, is imaginative and creative and doesn't yeah. <clears throat> doesn't hold any rules for right. regular life. Yeah. And isn't really about like you, right? No, it's about the interactions and it's, it's about the collaboration and and that's I mean, that's where it's interesting. So now you're helping me answer your inquiry more, which is. This, this big self-cherishing issue we have, right? It's like really not there during flow state. You know, I know when I used to work here at the emergency room at general, like 10, 12 hour shifts, I wouldn't look in the mirror the whole time, right? And not just because I was busy, but like you're so occupied with something that matters so much more mm. that your whole like situation about you know presentation and being who you are it just fades mm. and it's so funny how much we enjoy that even you know um beyonce can offer <laughs> that to us right or a big collective event a spectacle like what do we love about it right like we're you know no longer just us and part of the whole and you know i think this again, you know, the essential quality of flow state, which you're describing. And, and I mean, with meditation, you're not doing it for the relief. You're doing it so you can be more available to all beings. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's interesting of like the purpose, because you could like, you know, hack your flow so that you can buy more, sell more, right? Not really be necessarily in this harmonious relationship. So intention matters so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing. We'll love to hear more stories. Absolutely. <laughs>
um, many. Oh, this is such a great um, conversation. Next week, I'll here sneak preview. Next week, we're going to talk about bringing all adversity into the path and post-traumatic growth and how that kind of shows up in a lot of these stories of the Buddha. I thought we might get there tonight, but man, is it beautiful. Just really, it's such a nice, I think, compliment to this, um, bringing our full awareness to our breath, really giving ourselves that nourishment and also preparing ourselves to be okay with whatever happens, right? Really being able to feel like whatever happens, I can bring that to the path. That is much better than any life insurance policy you could ever have in your entire life. Like there's no better like payout, right? Than feeling like I can meet whatever is coming, right? Because the inevitable losses are, are apparent and everywhere. So, yeah. So maybe we'll do, yeah, a bit of a longer sit to close because I think that's a really nice place for us to close. What's the incense that's in the room when I look in this I do not. There's no incense. So there's it's a relaxing. It might just be the tea candles. We'll see if they're scented. Yeah. Yeah. So I promise I won't count you into a blackout surgery, but that would also be okay. <laughs> no, I love that. So good. So just feel that subtle shift between kind of orienting our sense portals to listening and seeing and thinking and feel just the, the graciousness of turning that inward. As was so beautifully described, feel the intimacy of our breath. It's so close, it's so precious. Really seeing if we can treat our practice not as something that needs to happen when all the conditions are perfect, but something that's happening in the midst of everything. So finding calm and finding space and connection, even with sounds and movement, even with our maybe eager mind already thinking about what's next. Can all that be present and there still be this quality of mindfulness, presence, awareness? Taking a moment and really generating this awakened heart, this bodhicitta, awakening that sense of care and kindness that's always alive within us. At some level, is kindness that brought all of us here this evening. Either a kindness to ourself to be held in community, reflection, a kindness for others, a desire to show up and allow ourselves to learn how to be more open-hearted and clear in this world. And just feel that spark of unconditioned kindness. bringing to mind maybe a group of people in the world or 
an area of the world right now that could really use our love and care and support. So many. So many areas where people in one day lose everything or are suffering under years of difficulty and adversity. And allow the stirring of the heart and that kindness to really motivate us further into our practice. And if it's comfortable bringing hands together at the heart in this posture of dedication and posture of offering. And imagine the sense of really offering up anything that we have gathered here together, the symbolic desire that any kind of spark of understanding or joy, any empathy or tenderizing that we dedicate this, that all beings could know peace and ease, all beings could know their true nature, and all beings could be free and let go. So great to be here with you all. So lovely.